Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Father Ricardo very much for inviting me here. Uh, I know this is his home, and it's my first time in his home. So I feel very honored. Um, he taught me that the church is a place of both worship and dialogue. You come here, he says, to feed your soul, but also to feed your mind, your brain. So he says, can you come and tell us what you are doing? Maybe it helps us feed our brains. We'll see to that. I also want to thank you personally, um, because with this beautiful day, of which I hear you don't get many, <laughs> uh, you made the effort to be here. So I am going to submit to you, propose to you, that this is enough credit to go to heaven. <laughs> the day of final judgment, do say to St. Peter when he welcomes you there, ignore all my sins, I put up with that lecture from that economist from the World Bank in the best day of the year for more than an hour, and I didn't fall asleep, okay? Uh, look, thank you again. Thank you very much for inviting me. I want to start with two contextual points. The first point is to define what I mean when I say poverty. This is a lecture about poverty. Um, international standards say that poverty is to live with $5.50 a day or less. $5.50 a day or less. That defines you anywhere in the world as poor. And if you live with $1.90 or less per day, that defines you as extremely poor. Okay? Now, think about it. $5.50 a day. Uh, that's a tough life. One in every two human beings, 3.5 billion people, live on $5.50 a day or less. Half of the world population. And about 800 million people around the world live with $1.9 a day or less. Okay. These are astonishing numbers. You know? uh, when I do this talk in universities, I ask students, could you please try for a second to imagine your life with $5.50 a day or less? OK, so tell me, how would your life be? And it's beautiful what they do, right? They immediately they say, I'll have to cut back on Uber. Really? And the other one says, I had to give up Netflix. The other one says, the cream I buy for my spots had to be cheaper. Okay? Absolutely no idea what it means to live with $5.5 a day or less. It means never touching motorized transport. You walk everywhere. Okay? Everywhere. You don't have the luxury to get into a car, a bus, or a train. Remember, half of the world population live like that. Then I tell the students, look, no motor transport and no electricity. It's not about your iPhone. There is no electricity. You can pay for it. Moreover, there is no cream, but there is also no health care. You can pay for a doctor. You just go wherever they can help you. Okay? And you have to see their faces when I say, if you live with that kind of money a day, would you spend your money in toilet paper? And they look amazed. Life without toilet paper. Well, that's how miserable it is for one in every two human beings on the planet. Okay? So dimensions, that's the first point I want to make to you. The poverty we are going to be talking about today is something that we don't even experience. It's difficult for us on this side of the fence to understand it, even though half of our fellow human beings live like that. Now, the second contextual point I want to make to you is I know you feel that the world is going crazy. Okay? I mean, let's be honest. Whatever newspaper you read or television you watch, any channel, radio, you say, what happened to my world? You know? uh, all of a sudden, populism takes over reason. 
pushes reason aside. Uh, nationalism pushes globalization away. The idea of integrating countries is now no good. Uh, ideology is pushing science. Things are because I say they are, not because they are. Moreover, science is beginning to be seen as, mm, I don't know what this. I don't like what it says. Now, in this world that is going crazy, to be poor with $5.50 a day or less is a real problem. Because your hopes of ever making it, of anybody paying attention to you, are very few, very little hope. And you see, no migration, no, nobody wants migrants. <laughs> Block it. Not only here, in Europe. You have to see what's happening across the Mediterranean. People die trying to reach the other coast. Or racism. I mean, when the world, when the world goes crazy, you tend to think poverty has no solution. OK? So today, it, I'm going to present to you a very contrarian, very optimistic view of poverty. Over the next 30 minutes, hopefully, maybe 35 if you allow me, if you don't fall asleep, my idea is over the next 30 to 40 minutes to bring you right into the trenches of the war against poverty and to tell you what is being done, what governments around the world are trying to do, how they fail mostly at what they are trying to do, what things give us hope. Okay? I'm going to bring you right into it. I'm going to make you experts, colleagues in the trenches of the war on poverty. Okay? I should speak a little bit about me before you believe how many trenches did I see. Well, I have 30 years in the World Bank. Uh, I work in every region of the world uh, in every capacity. I was director for Africa for many years. I was in the Soviet Union when it collapsed. Uh, I was in Latin America for many, many years. I started my career in the Middle East, actually living in Cairo, in Egypt. Uh, I worked ma many years in South Asia in India. I did a little bit of Southeast Asia, Indonesia. So I've seen a lot. I want to bring you right into this experience. And I will tell you, I'm still very optimistic. Why I'm optimistic? When people are at this level of poverty, so many of them, and the world is going crazy. Why am I optimistic? And the reason is, or has to do, with a combination of politics, of all things, and technology. That combination of politics and technology is making us change the way the war on poverty is being fought. Okay? And I'm going to give you a few ideas on that, if I can get this thing to work. Um, I'm going to postulate here. I probably you won't see this one, you will see the next one. This is too small, but it says ending poverty has never been more possible for more countries. Because this combination of politics and technology that I'm going to explain is changing, for example, the way our governments behave. To the point where I say that one day governments will work for you. Now, when you say this in the US, <laughs> when you say this in the US, I said this two days ago in Frankfurt, in Germany, two days ago. And in Germany, nobody doubts that the government works for you, right? I mean, here in the US, you mostly don't doubt it, right? Well, everywhere, everywhere else I ever been, including my own country, we felt that the government was part of the problem. I was raised by, in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, in a working class neighborhood, where my family migrated to from Italy, from Italy. My family came exactly from the same part of Italy where the Pope came from and settled in the same neighborhood of Buenos Aires. Okay? Uh, these are Piemonteses. For us, for that neighborhood, in my childhood, the whole game of life was running away from government. They were the ones that caused hyperinflation. They were the ones that produced electricity outages because they owned the companies. They were the ones that confiscated deposits one day. Uh, most of the robberies were organized by the police. My Italian mother had this fantastic phrase. She would say to you very proudly, she never went to college, by the way, she, but she was very well educated, and she would say to you, 
Every asset in our family has been stolen at least once. The car, the house, the wallets, everything. And I never went to the police. She was very proud. Okay? The government was a problem. I think my grandchildren will live a life in which the government will work for them. And I will explain why that's possible. The second big change that the combination of politics and technology is bringing about is the way we manage our economies. For all the noise that you hear in the newspapers, we are all converging. People begin to believe that the good way to manage an economy is with balanced budgets. The government should have no deficits. We should have very little debt. We should have a very independent Federal Reserve, something is called everywhere else Central Bank. We should have an open economy, meaning trading with all countries. We should regulate a lot, but smartly. And we should treat investors well. Not just the big foreign investors, but also the local person that is opening a shop in her neighborhood. Now, these principles, we, the profession, we all agree. But countries seem to be doing something totally different. And I'm going to explain to you why they are going to converge again. Third change that we are observing is on social policy. We have new weapons to fight the war on poverty. I'm going to claim to you that we are on our way, and you saw the phrase in the little advertisement that we used to bring you here. I had the phrase there, we are on our way to knowing the poor by name, individually, one by one. And what you, in the past, reducing poverty was helping groups, those that have a certain skin color, or those that live in a certain part of town, or those that have a certain profession. In West Africa, if you repair shoes, you are bound to be poor. You are considered almost untouchable. Well, now, reducing poverty is helping the person individually. The government has enough information to help you and tailor the support to you, not to your group. Okay? I'll come back to this. Uh, we also see a change in, the, in our society attitude towards exclusion. What do I mean by that? Typical case, big capital in, say, Africa, Lagos in Nigeria, big car driven by a chauffeur, one person at the back, and lots of little kids at the traffic light banging on the window asking for money. Okay? The idea that we can live isolated from all these little kids and the millions of people behind the kids and still be a viable country, that idea is no longer accepted by anybody. Every government, no matter how undemocratic it is, thinks we better fix this problem. Even the rich in this country, the people inside that big car, today say, why don't we fix that problem? Because all these people that we leave behind can one day explode. Uh, next change that we observe is how science enters ministries. Now, the word minister in the U.S. tends to be a priest. Everywhere else, what you call a secretary, secretary of education, secretary of health, secretary of defense, everywhere else is called the minister of education, the minister of defense, and the minister of health. Now, ministries today behave very different from how they behave 30 years ago when I joined the World Bank. Okay. Uh, 30 years ago, the Minister of Education of Brazil was a man, old, and background engineer. And his only purpose as a minister was to build schools. It was all about buildings, cement. Okay. Today, the Minister of Education in Brazil is a young woman. And her preoccupation is how to stimulate the brain of children under the age of five. Why? Well, because science has found out that the plasticity of the brain, meaning the speed at which one cell connects with the next cell, is called the synopsis, that speed peaks at 700 synopsis per second in the first 18 months of life. If you stimulate at that time, the child that shows up in primary school at the age of six is totally different from the one that you don't stimulate. That's why 
rich people now are all fanatics about putting a stimuli to kids before they get to school. Poor people are not doing that yet. Okay, so in five years we'll have a problem. That's the preoccupation today of the minister. She's using science that before wasn't even there. We didn't know the effects. Okay? Uh, finally, I say uh, that foreign aid, you know what foreign aid is? When one country gives money to another country, okay? Uh, normally it's grants, just give money away. And foreign aid has been criticized because sometimes the money is given to countries that are either undemocratic or you're just trying to prop up a dictator of some sort. So it has been very criticized. What is happening now is that people are thinking, yes, we need to change it, we need to adapt it, but we shouldn't abandon it, okay? Now, you put all these things together, and you begin to feel that Africa, a continent that I love dearly, where I worked for many years, even Africa could make it. Today, I'm hopeful for Africa. 30 years ago, it was like pushing on a string. You keep pushing, 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 but nothing happens. Today, Africa may still make it. That's our hope. Now, all this picture that I painted for you has many risks, okay? Uh, there are risks immediate in the next two years. One big risk, how fast the U.S. is going to increase interest rates. You know, your Federal Reserve in Washington is about to raise interest rates. If they do it too fast, the economic growth will stop. If they do it too slow, Wall Street will continue taking risks and doing crazy stuff because money is so cheap. Well, the rest of the world is watching. If you raise it too fast, countries abroad will suffer. Another risk, very much in front of us, is a trade war. You heard about this, right? Trade war, no? It's like I want to export more to you than you export to me, right? It's like a fight, it's like a zero-sum game. One of us has to lose. Well, I will explain this in a minute, but that's the worst idea possible. You don't want to fight a trade war, and I will explain why. You fight a trade war, and we will see unemployment levels that we haven't seen, we haven't seen since the 1930s, which, by the way, that was also based on a trade war. And the final risk that we see has to do with China. Okay, China, everybody says, well, it's growing so fast, and it's been growing so fast for so long. They seem to have the right recipe. Truth is, within China, there's a giant problem with debt, what they call domestic debt. Municipalities have been borrowing and borrowing and borrowing to keep this growth going and going and going. And I've seen it with my own eyes. Some of this is construction of cities where nobody lives. I went there at night, and I couldn't find a single light. I saw conference centers, giant conference centers, where there was never a conference, okay? I seen hotels, you know, super luxurious places, where I was the only guest. Now, all this means some of that debt will never be repaid. So China still has to go through a very tough adjustment internally in a political system that is quite close. People cannot speak up. So you have risks, no? Now you have also risks in the long term. What happens if climate change is true? I'm not going to take part here, but what happens if it is true? No? What happens if the oceans rise? What happens to all these big cities that we have that we invested so much money in? How about cybersecurity? What happens if tomorrow my credit card doesn't work anymore? Let us think about it. No, you go to your now ATM machine, no money. Credit card, no response. Cell phone, no, doesn't work. We are one hack away from that. So there are risks to this world that I painted to you. But if you put it all together, I know this is difficult to see, but if you put it all together, the change in governments, better economic management, new tools for social policy, more acceptance of all society, not leaving segments behind. When you start putting all these things together, you begin to regain hope, okay? Even though the world is crazy and there are so many poor people, you begin to get some hope. Now, I don't have a lot of time, uh, and I will leave this presentation with you. I'll be happy to send it by email. Ricardo has it, so you can count on it. So don't worry too much about it. But because I don't have a lot of time, I thought 
I could cover the first three issues, governments, economic policy, and social policy, and if I had, if I had time, I also covered inclusion. Now, that requires about 25 more minutes of attention. If you are done with it, just raise your hand and wave it like this, and say no more, okay? Remember, we are feeding the brain, and the brain sometimes says enough, no? Uh, so let me go for it. Why did I say that governments one day will work for you? Why do I believe that my grandchildren will live in, in a world, by the way, my kids are American, so they look at me and say, Dad, the government works for you. Say, <laughs> That's here. Everywhere else is not. But why do I think that every kid will see that in the future? Well, I have three reasons to say that. First is what we call the accountability systems around our leaders. You know, when you're a government, you are held accountable, or you should be held accountable. There are four Ds, letters Ds, that I want you to remember when you think about the accountability of your leaders, be that the mayor of this city or the president of your country. The first D is democracy. The second D is decentralization. I will explain what that means. Third D is devices, these ones. And the fourth is debt. Okay? Now, what do I mean by democracy? I wish I was given a quarter every time I give this lecture and a journalist at the back ask the question, is democracy necessary for economic development? And they expect me to say, yes, of course, human rights, you know. Imagine their faces when I say, no, it's not. The journalist stands up and runs away to put a headline saying the World Bank says we don't need democracy. Okay? What they have in mind is China. How can China grow so much, lift so many people out of poverty, more than ever seen in human history, and still be not democratic? Well, what happens is that what you need is not democracy in the sense of voting. That's very nice. We vote every four years. What you need is political contestability. Let me repeat that word, political contestability. What does that mean? It means if I don't do well as a, gov as a leader or as a governor, somebody's there to take my job. That's contestability. Okay? Within the Communist Party in China, there is tremendous political contestability. If you are a local governor of a province and you want to make it to Beijing and be somebody at the national level, you have to deliver the goods. You have to produce all this construction that I mentioned to you. By the way, in their system, in the political system of China, the Communist Party is dominated not by economists, but by engineers. So they feel that if they don't deliver cement and construction, some other leader will take over. So it's a tremendous competition within a party. That's political contestability. That's what you need for your governments to begin to work for you. This is now happening everywhere. For a second reason, which is decentralization. Decentralization is a word that means more and more of my public services are not decided by the federal government or the state government, are decided locally. You decentralize the service. Okay? So, for example, education in the U.S. is all at the county level. Okay? In most countries, it's a federal duty. Uh, water systems may also be at the county level. National defense, no, it's at the federal level. Because you have one army defending everyone. Printing money, federal level. One currency for everyone. Now, more and more of these responsibilities are going down to local authorities everywhere else in the world. Now, you will say, well, what was the difference? Ah, big difference. Because it's a lot easier to complain, to hold accountable a local mayor that lives in my village or my neighborhood than to hold accountable the president of the country. You know, I love fishing. No? I uh, love it. So I fish in the Potomac. Great, but the houses in the Potomac are a two, three million dollar type of houses. They don't like to see me fishing in front of their boats, okay? So somebody blew the whistle on me, and the mayor of Alexandria, Virginia, wrote an ordinance saying, no fishing, okay? So I said, oh, God, this is the end of my life. I mean, fishing has been with me forever. 
So I used my economics, and I wrote this long memo to the local newspaper explaining the economic benefits of letting people fish in the Potomac. Okay? It was an invention. No? I was saying things like, I can go fishing while my wife goes shopping. So now she doesn't go shopping. No? Anyway, because as it may, the mayor immediately sent me an email. No? Excuse me, who are you and why? And I said, look, not only did I say that this is an economic reason you have to let me fish, but I won't say yet until you tell me that you will remove this ordinance that most of the fishing people that go there are either low income or minorities, and I'm a Latino. Following day, the ordinance comes down. Okay? Thank you, thank you very much, thank you. Now, think about it. If the responsible party for, my, for the fishing in Alexandria was not a local authority, but was President Trump, and I sent a letter like that to President Trump, the next thing I know is the FBI is at my house arresting me. Okay? This decentralization technically is called proximity between those that make policy decisions, policy decisions, and those that are supposed to benefit from them. The proximity, the physical proximity, is welfare enhancing. That's a technical term. Okay? Thirdly, devices. Devices. This is the beauty. Back to my neighborhood in Buenos Aires. Okay? Remember, military government, they couldn't care, they were the problem. It was electricity went out all the time. Power outages all the time. So I was already a teenager, and I thought, how about if I organize a demonstration? Okay. So I went, you know, rebellious kid. I went to my first friend. He was sleeping, you know, his siesta. I said, well, maybe not today, maybe tomorrow. So I had to walk to the second friend, and she was saying, no, my mom will not let me do that. Went to a third friend, he was working. By night time, I gave up. Okay. Now, fast forward, about two years ago, three years ago, three years ago, three summers ago, uh, hot in Buenos Aires, super hot, electricity goes out. That morning, a granddaughter taught her grandmother how to use Twitter. Okay? So when electricity goes out, very hot, grandma, just to show the granddaughter how she used Twitter, has this idea calling for everyone to show up in front of the presidential palace, La Casa Rosada, Okay, with pots and pans and bang them. By 9 p.m., there was 100,000 people in front of Casa Rosada. And if you go to Buenos Aires today, every corner has these giant, ugly-looking generators because the government is scared sugarless that people will demonstrate if the electricity goes out. What grandma did is something called collective action. In my times, collective action was very costly. I had to go from house to house to house to house. For her, it has zero cost. It was just one Twitter. The cost of collective action, thanks to these devices, is now zero. Okay? That keeps our leaders on their toes. Finally, is the D for debt. Okay? Now, almost every country has issued by now bonds. The US has been doing this for 300 years. No? You pay for wars with bonds. Okay? And those bonds are traded in the international financial market 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they have a price. Pick, 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 pick. You see it now on the screen. You can see it on your iPhone. Very interesting stuff. Now, the moment you decide to do something crazy, the price of those bonds collapse. So take South Africa, big, strong country in Africa. About two years ago, the then president, Jacob Zuma, decided to fire the Minister of Finance, a very respected Minister of Finance, because he wanted to do some deal that the minister opposed. So he fires the president and puts a crony of him to be, sorry, he, did, he fires the minister and puts a crony friend of him to be minister. The price of the bonds, South African bonds, collapsed, but within an hour. By nighttime, that new minister was fired and they had to look for somebody credible, an old hand, to come back to the ministry, okay? That president, never messed again with the economy. Because the debt that the country has, which is traded all the time, is priced in real time now. And investors can tell by pricing whether they like or don't like how the economy is being managed. That's a 4D. So put it together, democracy, decentralization, devices, and debt, today is very difficult to be a dictator. 
If you ever wanted to be a dictator or a king or a queen, it's too late. You should look for another job. It's too late. It's not pleasant anymore. OK? Now, I tempted to talk about the second point. I'm running out of time. So I will do it. Okay? If you think it's too long, you let me know and I stop. But I want to talk about the second point, the second aspect that makes our governments be afraid of us a little bit more than before. Remember, I said for this, there is another issue now, a new technology. Remember politics and technology? A new technology that we didn't have. And it's something called impact evaluation. Impact evaluation. No? Uh, today, you cannot really do a PhD in economic development if you don't do an impact evaluation. And it can get very sophisticated, very statistics and numbers, very sophisticated. But the essence is very simple. And if you learn this, I promise that tomorrow when you open the newspaper, you will read with different eyes. OK? So bear with me for a second. What is impact? Well, every action by the government, be that a policy, a decision, a program, a project, every action by a government has four components, four components. Input, output, outcome, also called result, and impact. Input, output, outcome, and impact. Input is money. You put money to build a school. That's input. Output is the physical consequence of putting money. Is the school building, cement. That's the output. Outcome is the consequence of the output, children studying in the school. Impact is a subset of the outcomes that would not have happened had the government not intervened. I know I lost you, I know. So I'm coming with an example you will understand in a minute. But keep this in mind. The impact is what happens that would not have happened had the government not intervened. So every impact is an outcome, but not every outcome is an impact. I know, I lost you. So let me give you the example. And the example is back to me. Not now, but when I was 12. Back to Buenos Aires. Everything I learned in economics, I learned at home. Okay? I was told by my mother, the best macroeconomist I ever seen. I never went to college. Now, I was 12, and I had to go to school. I had to take public transportation. I had to take a bus. And my Italian mother would put these coins on the table. I remember that noise. The best noise, the best opera I ever heard. The coins coming every morning. I will grab the coins, run to the bus station, pay my ticket, and go from point A to point B and show up in school. My dream, remember, 12-year-old, was that the government one day will pay for the bus ticket of primary school students, that they will have that policy. So one day, lo and behold, they did. OK? I was so happy. So let's analyze the input, output, outcome, and impact of that policy, paying the bus ticket of the students. Well, the input was money. Somebody had to put money to pay the bus driver. Output was a physical display, displacement of Marcelito, that's me, from point A to point B. That's the output. Outcome, I went to school. Yeah. What was the impact of the government paying for my bus ticket? What happened that would not have happened had they not intervened? I began to drink beer. <laughs> That's what happened that would not have happened had they not intervened. They released my money. That very day, I became a Peronist. You know, a Peronist was a political party in my country. I said, this is the best government ever. Okay. Now, technically speaking, they pay for something called my unsatisfied marginal need. OK? Now, when it's Marcelo drinking beer, you say, oh, I don't care much. It's not a big deal, right? The impact, frankly, we love the outcome. Marcelo went to school. I hate the impact of the same policy. So practice one kid drinking beer, well, what can you do? But think about this country, in, well, I'll tell you which one, Nigeria, or this country in, North, in South America, Venezuela. They spend about 4% of a GDP. GDP is the size of the whole economy. The equivalent to 4% of the size of the whole economy, more than what they spend in health or education, subsidizing the gasoline consumed by the rich. I know, you can't even conceive this, right, that somebody would pay for your gasoline. But today in Venezuela, gasoline is basically free. And in Nigeria, is cents for a gallon. 
These are oil-rich countries. So they decided to subsidize the gasoline to everybody. But the only, the only people that have cars are the rich. So essentially, they spend 4% of GDP, meaning more than health, more than education, in subsidizing the gasoline consumed by the rich. Okay? Let's analyze the input, output, outcome, and impact of that policy. Input, money. Output, gasoline in the car of these people. Outcome, these people drive big cars. What's the impact? What happened that would not have happened had they not intervened? Well, I'm guessing bigger cigars for these rich people, more trips to Disney World, perhaps more money piled abroad in Switzerland, because they were going to drive that amount of time as whether the gasoline was that price or not. They were rich. Now, I'm going to give you one more example, and this is close to home, the World Bank. What is the impact of the World Bank? The World Bank is a bank that lends to poor governments out of Washington. That's a gross definition of my institution, but that's what we do. So I have seen this with my own eyes, more or less. Imagine this dictator in Africa. And the dictator is almost corrupt, half corrupt. I don't know, he's thinking about being corrupt, OK? And he has money only for building a school or buying jewelry for his seventh wife. And by the way, I know quite a few clients of mine that have more than seven, okay? And of course, that's the youngest one. So he has to decide, do I use my money for the school or do I use my money for bling for my youngest wife, okay? So the guy is almost corrupt. He does the right thing by build the school. Imagine if instead comes the World Bank, we come. You know, our ties, very well dressed, very well educated. We speak any language you want us to speak. And we go there and say, Mr. President, we come from the World Bank. And he says, what's the World Bank? And we say, well, it's an institution that does development for you. And what is development? Well, we give you loans so you can build clinics, roads, schools. And he says, you build the schools? And we say, yeah, very good schools. Our schools are great. Technically, the best schools in the world. The light comes the right way. The cement is very solid. It's earthquake resistant. Moreover, there will be no corruption around our school because we will procure. We will buy the cement and the iron and all that. So the president says, would you build me a school? And we say, yeah, Mr. President, we'll be happy to. And we do. We'll give a loan, have a project, build a school. We all take photographs with the kids walking to the school. Very happy. What is the impact of the World Bank intervention? What happened that would not have happened had we not intervened? We pay for jewelry for the first lady. We did, because we free up his money so he doesn't have to pay for the school. Every time you see a policy, think about what happened had they not intervened. What happened that would not have happened had they not intervened? I'm going to touch home now. I'm going to guess, just a guess, okay, that each of these households, and by the way, you all look like very solid couples, so let me tell you, I'm very proud to be here. Every one of you, on average, receives about $3,000 a year through the interest uh, deduction from your mortgage. When you pay taxes, the fact that you get $3,000 back because the interest on your mortgage is tax deductible, right? And I'm guessing more or less what the houses cost here, probably $3,000, right? You know, probably that or more. Back in Washington, it's probably like $6,000 per household that the government gives you back, okay? Let me ask you a question. What would happen, what would you cut back on if you had to give those $3,000 back to the government. Think about it. What would you cut back on if you now don't have the $3,000 tax deduction for your interest on the mortgage? I'm going to guess. One less vacation, OK? Uh, maybe one less trip to some fancy fashion shop, OK? You will repair the watch instead of buying a new one. Think about it, $3,000 less, probably that's what you will do, one vacation less. So when the government, the federal government, decides to give you the interest subsidy, in effect, it's paying for your vacation. The impact of that policy is your unsatisfied marginal need. Now, this issue that governments do crazy things 
behind trying to do good things because they are trying to give you the opportunity to own a house, but effectively they pay for your vacation. This idea that the impact can be terrible compared to the outcome is something that we didn't know before. And now we do. Now we do. Now we can see a policy in the newspaper. Every morning I play that exercise, no? and I say, what are they doing today? This. All right, let me see what the impact of that will be. Not the outcome, but the impact. Uh, let me continue. I know I'm totally abusing your time. Let me talk quickly about economic policy, because there is one issue I want to touch upon here. Uh, you all have a cell phone here, right? Everybody has something like this or similar. Don't tell me that you have a flip phone, because that will qualify you as very old-fashioned. Uh, this thing is a product. It says here, made in the US. But this thing is a product of components uh, produced in more than 40 countries. You all carry with you a little bit of lithium that comes from the highlands of Bolivia. Okay? Most of the motherboard is assembled in China. Even if it's an iPhone. Um, this rubber is probably from Vietnam, this protection, because that's where the rubber is the cheapest. Everything that you touch today, everything you put your hands on, even your clothing, is produced out of something called a global value chain, meaning the final product is the assembling of components from many countries. The refrigerator at home may say made in Mexico, but I almost guarantee you that the design is from California. If it's cool, your refrigerator is probably from California. Okay? Uh, everything is part of a global value chain. The idea that things can be produced from bottom up entirely in one country is no longer possible. Nothing, nothing, okay? Now, if you are in this world of global value chains, you are only invited to the global value chain to contribute to it, say that you are very good at producing keyboards for these phones, you will only be invited if you are reliable, if you are the cheapest, if you can produce good standards, they tell you how the keyboard has to be and you deliver accordingly. You have to be very serious to be invited to a global value chain. Your country cannot be fooling around with you. You cannot be saying, I'm on a strike. My workers don't want to work. Because if you don't deliver the keyboard, then all the other countries producing the iPhone lose money. Okay? So investors, people that want to build things, today only go to invest in global value chains. That's the reason why globalization is a good thing. Now, it has a lot of other problems, particularly if you were not globalized and suddenly you are globalized, so people have to adapt and many cannot. But globalization is not an ideology. It's a technology. You cannot reinvent, sorry, disinvent something that you have already invented. There's no way that this phone can now be all built in one place from top to bottom, find the lithium somewhere in the US, all the way to the phone, and I still pay $200. You'll probably pay 3000 meaning it's not possible to sell. So this is changing completely the way economies are managed. You saw what happened in the US very recently about the aluminum and the steel uh, tariffs. No? It was a big bravado. We are going to put tariffs. The phone began to run, uh, to ring. Mr. President, look. We need that aluminum because it's part of a value chain where we produce solar panels. And then the solar panel, on the other hand, brings components from India. We are very cheap, very good, very reliable. You cannot break that apart. Remember only, if you remember this is good, globalization is not an ideology, it's a technology. And you cannot disinvent the technology. One final point and I'll let you go. Let me talk about social policy here. Uh, Remember, we have governments that are much more accountable now. The world very united in terms of production. We are all part of a global value chain. Touch anything around you, your watch, your clothing, will be components from many countries. The third thing that happened that gives really hope to the poor is this idea that I mentioned to you that we are on our way to knowing the poor by name, individually. Believe it or not, this was invented in Mexico, okay? And this was 1995. 
when the president, who by the way was an accidental president, he wasn't supposed to be the president, the presidential candidate got shot and killed, so they grab this guy, yeah, and they say, you are the president. He said, no, no, I'm an academic, you are the president, okay? He said, together with his director for the budget, he's a good friend of mine, he's now a vice president at another international bank, the two of them said, look, how about if we transfer money directly to each poor person? transfer money directly to each poor person. And we just leave them out of poverty. We just put money in the pocket. When they came up with this idea, it's called cash transfers, okay? Everybody was against. The World Bank, we were against. I was the lead economist for Mexico, so I was in the kitchen of this idea. And we were all against. We wrote papers. How crazy it was going to be, because the poor, once they get the money, they are going not to work anymore. That's it, okay? They're going to slack up. The Catholic Church also was against. Politicians were against. Why? Because all of a sudden, society was going to say, we didn't know we had so many poor people here. Okay? These two hard-headed types went ahead anyway. Okay? And at the time, I saw it with my own eyes, the way they did this is they had to go literally and meet the poor. Okay? I remember that we fought the war of ideas. At the end, they only conceded that the cash transfer was going to have a condition. So the program became known as conditional cash transfers, CCTs. So they were going to give the money to the poor pregnant woman if she showed that she went to the clinic to check herself at least three times in the first six months. Or they were going to give a transfer to a father if he can show that the kids were in a school and stay in a school. So we all say put conditions, and they accepted to put conditions. Out goes these buses, literally pickup trucks, into faraway communities in Mexico. And what they found is that these people did not exist. They were standing there, but they didn't legally exist. They had no birth certificate, no property titles, no contracts. They were not part of society. They were not just poor, they were also excluded. So the government has to establish a mechanism to first identify the person. Well, who are you? Because you're going to give public money to somebody that you don't have even a name for. Most of the signatures were an X because these people don't even, didn't even read or write. So the government established a mechanism. Uh, at the time was these pickup trucks going there once a month showing that people have been in school and the mothers have checked themselves up in the med doctor and then transfer the, give the money in cash. Now, we were thinking that, we were obsessed with the condition. Keep the kid in school, check the mother, the pregnant mother. We were all wrong. What mattered is that by transferring the money, the Mexican government was forced to go and meet the poor person individually, establish a relationship with Pedro get to know who Pedro is, and then have a logistics to transfer the money. Now, you fast forward 25 years, every developing country, by now every country in the world, transfers cash to the poor one way or the other. And every country has a mechanism that has to do with debit cards. It's all about debit cards. In some African countries, we do it by phone. They just transfer money in the phone, and you pay with the phone. Now, this has changed completely how you help the poor. You don't have to help the whole village. You help that person. When the American economy collapsed in 2008, remember October 2008 with the big crisis? Everybody expected that Mexico was going to explode socially. It was going to be a social explosion. Why? Because the sectors that in the American economy that got hit the hardest were the ones where the Mexican migrants worked and sent the remittances back home. They sent money back home. Remember, that was construction, and everything that has to do with uh, durable goods, which are produced in the northern part of Mexico and then shipped into Texas. All those people all of a sudden had no work. So we expected, I expected, an explosion in Mexico City. People go in the street and rioting. There was not a single demonstration, because some kids, because they were kids to me, sat in front of a computer in the Ministry of Finance and decided to transfer 15% more cash only to the families that were going to be affected by the, the crisis. And they knew who they were because 
every month they were given information every time they transferred the money. And in Mexico, there was no explosion. Now, when you do these things, when you design the support to the person rather than to the group, all kind of possibilities open. For example, you don't have to subsidize the gasoline for the rich anymore. You just charge whatever is the price of gasoline, and if you want to help the poor, you just give them money. Simple. Saudi Arabia is about to do that. Iran is doing that. Morocco did that. In the Middle East, where they have a lot of oil, they are now realizing, why are we subsidizing the rich? Moreover, in Africa, where there are a lot of minerals and gas and oil, all that money is corrupted away. The poor don't see much of it. With this new mechanism, you can say, no, 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 a portion of this money is going to be transferred to the people. I have a scientific paper published with a Vietnamese colleague that says, if you were to transfer 10% of the rent, the income, that comes from the exploitation of oil, gas, and mineral, minerals in Africa, you were to transfer to the African people uniformly and universally. Everybody gets the same cut. Then poverty in Africa at the $1.9 a day or less will disappear. That is now technologically possible. Final point, I promise, I promise, I promise, this is the last I talk. Uh, inclusion. I'm going to make one point only. When you hear the word inequality, and you shout the word inequality in a room like this, you very quickly see people in their faces who is from the left politically and who is on the right, okay? The people on the left say inequality, very important, they feel offended. The people on the right say, come on, you lazy, go and work, okay? It's so polarizing. Inequality is a concept that polarizes us. There's no agreement on it, okay? For the left, for what you call here in the US the liberals, uh, the inequality, the function of a government is to finish inequality by redistributing wealth, taxing the rich and giving the money to the poor, okay? Now, for the people on the right, the function of the government is to protect private property. Don't take my money. I earn it fairly and squarely. Now, for the left, it's an issue of social justice. For the right, it's an issue of personal effort. They will never agree, okay? Don't seek agreement on inequality. I've never seen agreement on this. However, when they disagree, are they disagreeing on the inequality of outcome? How much money do I get to earn? How much do I get to know the inequality of learning or, or educational achievement? How much? Uh, how much I get to live, the inequality of life expectancy. It's all inequalities of outcomes. And on this, we don't agree. Okay, don't even try. However, when you ask the same audience, do we all agree on equality of opportunity? Everybody says, yeah, sure, opportunity. Everybody has the same opportunity. The people on the right say, oh, that's justice. The people on, sorry, that's on the left. The people on the right say, Sure, give them the same chance to everybody and whoever works harder gets the goodies. So you say, well, if you disagree on inequality of outcome, why don't we do something about inequality of opportunity? And the reason why we never did anything about inequality of opportunity is because we couldn't measure it. For the inequality of outcomes, things like your wealth, your education, your life expectancy, we had a measurement created by an Italian more than 100 years ago a fellow by the name of Corrado Gini. So we have the Gini coefficient, some stuff there. For the inequality of opportunity, we have no coefficient. So we cannot measure it, we can do nothing about it. That changed about, I would say, eight years ago. A consortium of researchers from Latin America came up with an index of human opportunity. There is a way now to measure your how probable it is that you will make it in life. And I'm not going to tell you the mathematics of it is super complicated, but the essence of the concept is this. How important are your personal circumstances, those of which you have no control or responsibility when you are a child, like your skin color, your gender, your family's wealth, your birthplace? These are circumstances in childhood that you cannot control. You're not responsible for this. 
How important are those circumstances for your chances to accessing the services without which you cannot make it in life? For example, one service that probabilistically is almost a sure shot that you will not make it in life is if you don't finish fourth grade on time. Okay? If you don't finish fourth grade on time, your probability of going to college is about zero. Don't ask me why, that's what the numbers say. Okay? Now, let me repeat this. If your circumstances when you are a child will determine your access to services, like clean water, that's another thing. If you don't have clean water between zero and two, you are bound to have a diminished mental capacity for life. Okay? That's how bad it is. If you are stunted, you have no good nutrition between zero and two, for sure your capacity in life, mental capacity is diminished. So how important are these personal circumstances over which you have no control responsibility for you to access the services without which you will not make it in life? You can construct an index with these uh, personal circumstances. In fact, we constructed an index on the president of Peru at that time. This is some years ago. And I went to him and I said, Mr. President, you are a statistical miracle. You shouldn't be here. No, his personal story, he was a shoeshine boy abandoned in Peru and some missionaries from the US adopted him and brought him here. Yeah, well. Or you can be a soccer genius and then, sure. But everybody else, 99.9, .9, if you have certain personal circumstances at the beginning, you won't make it later on. So the question is, can we adapt our public policy to make sure that your personal circumstances in childhood don't matter to your chances in life? You may still ruin it, no? We give you all the, you know, all the services and you still screw up. But can we do that? And the answer is today you can. The answer is yes, because you can measure it. So countries like Colombia are now beginning to say, look, why don't we focus not on inequality of outcome, but inequality of opportunity? OK? All right, I promise to let you go. Let me finish with this. Uh, I'm not going to, hold on, hold on. Let me take you back. You remember all these? These are the issues that we cover. Behind each of these boxes, there are a lot of policy to talk about. I'm not going to do it. Don't panic. I'm going to leave this presentation with you. However, let me leave you with the take-homes. The first one is, yes, the world seems to be going crazy, okay? But economic development and the poverty reduction that goes with it has never been more possible for more countries. I hope you accept that much. Uh, what is behind all this is politics and technology. You cannot disinvent things. Remember that as well. Now, you should focus where as policymakers in problem solving. You now have the data of the person. Help that person solve the problem. Forget about the groups. Go for the individual. And the final point, which is closer to home, yeah, money is still good. Charity is still good. But ideas are much better than money. Let me stop there. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.